Hi everyone in cloud computing and welcome to episode 20 of the Cloud Computing Training Show with Brad Nelson and internationally recognized and world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. In this week's show David and I will be talking about what are the top three training priorities for 2019. Hi Dave, great to see you and welcome back to another Cloud Computing Training Show. Training priorities and uh, for 2019, the reason I wrote this is a lot of a lot of questions that we're getting from clients in terms of, you know, what do I do to take my people who are uh, not so smart on cloud now and making them smart on cloud by the end of next year? And um, I'm kind of taken back by that because I can certainly point them at lynda.com and I can point them at Cloud Guru and I can point them at, at some of the uh, learning tree courses that are there and certainly the certifications. But the reality is I think the biggest priority that you need to do for 2019 is to plan, is to create a plan that's gonna be succinct in terms of what kind of training you need. And so you should do a skills gap analysis. And obviously I'm, I'm probably one of the least qualified of both of us to, to go through that, but the ability to kind of look at where your technical abilities are now, do a skills inventory in terms of your existing staff, and then figure out what your skills are gonna need in your 2B state by the end of 2019, and then figure out the best way to either get the skills, meaning we have to obtain them by going through excellent recruiters like yourself, uh, versus uh, reinventing people um, so they understand cloud computing, uh, cloud computing in general. And I think that this is is going to be something that's a lot more complex than people really kind of understand. They think it's they're going to be throwing money at training courses and getting AWS certifications and things like that. But it's really about a comprehensive set of things that people have to move through, you know, as they kind of close the skills gaps they have right now and hiring the right people and retraining the right people and making this happen. So that's the number one priority is the ability to go do that. And I, I recommend people do that before they start going off and signing contracts with uh, outside trainers and uh, different uh, organizations and, and even vendors who are going to be doing the certifications because they may not need, need as many as they think, or they may underestimate what how much they need. Uh, and they really need to get a sort of budgetary constraints moving forward. So, you know, question for you, are you seeing people interested in, uh, you know, hiring in terms of skills, uh, in, in terms of reducing skills gaps, or are they uh, haven't thought that what, thought that through yet? Well, I think there's a number of ways um, that, that people are hiring now. And, and from, from experience of, of discussing this with people, it looks like people are looking for adaptability. So people that can can bring skills they've currently got, but also with the foresight of their learning curve with you know being able to change and be dynamic. I think that's really important. Soft skills are really up there as well because people really do need to, you know, if they're working remotely or working as part of a team, they need to be able to communicate properly and not be so um, ingrained in just the tech, which is obviously you know the main driver behind why they're employed in the first place. But equally, they've got to be able to be able to communicate and work as a team. I think that's very, very important. Um, and and, and we've, we've had discussions before about people focusing on their, their own outcomes of their own lives and, and making sure that what they're going to be focused on moving forward, uh, or sorry, what they're going to be focused on doing moving forward is, is focused around their happiness and, and making sure that they pick the right training with the outcomes that are going to make, ultimately make them happy at work. And whether that's uh, you know training that's sub, um, supplied by the employer, or, or you know you've gone to a job because you're going to get more in-house training that's going to to suit the need. Um, I think it's down to the individual though that's going to be identifying what they want to do and how they're going to do it. Uh, and and from a hiring manager's point of view. Uh, and, and we had this conversation a few weeks ago as well. I think it's down to the recruitment consultant to delve more deeper into the, the understanding of the outputs from the hiring manager um, to really understand the role, to make sure you're, you're putting the right people forward that are going to be fulfilled by the role and going to find the challenges, the sort of thing they want to do, and, and ultimately be happy in the role because the recruiter has identified more things within the role that you know the job description just doesn't give you um job descriptions can come across as quite stale and generic and you know you're just after the same old thing every time uh, when really there's a lot to it there's culture fit etc uh, and understanding exactly what the outputs are on a daily basis uh, and being able to relay that back to a, um, a potential cloud professional for that role i think is you know invaluable when it comes to finding the right person so i think there's a number answer you kind of answered the question but i think there's there's a number of different dynamics now what do you think on that, Dave? No, I, I think that's it. And I think the other thing I wanted to bring up is another priority is how people want to uh, want to be trained. Um, 
So uh, we're, we're at a point where you can basically be training classroom training and video training and reading and even OJT on the job training. And it doesn't necessarily make sense that we force everybody into the same sort of training track and understanding how they're going to augment their talent. An example would be I'm not a good classroom trainer. If you put me in a classroom, I get lost quick. Um, you should see my GPA from high school um, to prove that out. But the thing is, it's uh, uh, I taught class and I was a professor for 10 years and I um, had people consume my information, but I'm never really that willing to consume information that people are giving me by providing me a lecture. So I'm more of a doer, um, even a reader, or you know, some kind of a visual thinker uh, in terms of abstract reasoning and things like that. And so it, it probably makes sense that people understand how people are going to uh, comprehend and, and deal with the material. And it's not always gonna be the same for all people. I've noticed in my teams, for instance, some of them do like CBT, computer-based training, where they can take it whenever they want. Some of them like to uh, basically do things themselves and follow lessons on their own at their own pace, but become doers instead of people who listen to other people talk on CDPTs or in a classroom. And a lot of people like traditional classroom training because they grew up, you know, using that. They learned that way in college and high school, and they found that it could be successful. If not, that it's the greatest way to do it, but it's just more successful for them because they're able to um, uh, find it kind of a comforting experience. I've heard that a few times. Um, so, what are your what, what's your take on that? Do you think we should adjust training based on the expectations of the abilities of the people? Absolutely, and I think it comes down to as well learning, learning, or uh, as an employer, as and as an individual, identifying your learning strengths and and how quickly you learn and what's the most dynamic environment to learn in, uh, and that's a bit of self analysis for people that are already established in a job that don't have to question their corporate identity as such because they sort of take it for granted that's who they are. But when it's in such a volatile and disruptive industry as is the cloud environment and, and the way a lot of roles are going into cloud, you know, people really do have to, you know, so do some sort of self-identifying with regards to their learning capability, not from a sense of re retaining, but how they're retaining it and why and what suits their needs with regards to retaining, whether, like you said, you know, on-job training, the CBT training, um, something that's really going to tick the boxes for them. I think identifying that is key um, and also having the options available. So if you are um, a, 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 trial, a cloud a training provider, having the various different options where you can be in a room physically, you can do it virtually or, or do it uh, in real time virtually, or a, like you said, a, a, a CBT model, uh, that would work really well. I mean, look, this industry is massive and it's, it's, it's growing beyond all um, uh, shadow of a doubt, one of the quickest moving industries out there. Uh, the IDC recently reported that investment into digital transformation initiatives alone will reach 2.2 trillion by 2019. So I think that really does give um, a, a bit of pressure on people to make sure that identifying training and the right moving forward in the right direction is, is paramount, isn't it, don't you think? Yeah, I do. And in fact, as the single most limiting factor, I think as people move into the cloud or move into any kind of digital technology, uh, is really the lack of skill sets within the organization and visionaries and people who can actually do stuff. I mean, a final priority would be that of metrics, the ability to kind of gather success metrics out of this. Um, you know, I had some clients years ago where they found out that they were very unsuccessful in moving into the cloud, even though they had trained everybody up in AWS architecture and, you know, basically everything they were using in the system. But they really missed, you know, looking at core architectural kinds of things so people could bring things together. So why they were experts in certain cloud native things, such as AWS and Google and Microsoft, I can't remember what was in there. They were not experts at make, at figuring out how they all integrate together and drive together. And the reality is that there should have been metrics in terms of success that we could have seen that would externalize that problem early on so we could go fix it. Instead, we had to wait for things to fail. And one of the things that you need to do as a priority is to set a series of metrics in terms of small granular successes that are occurring at the team level. You know, are they migrating things to the system successfully? Are they integrating the systems? Is the security in place? And all this information coming back in questionnaires from the team leads you know, really will draw attention to the fact that you could be um, missing the boat in terms of training. And by the way, this is in the fault of the employees, the people who are building the, the systems, just the fault of the people who did the training plan. And they weren't able to provide adequate training, so they knew all the aspects of it and therefore knew whatever to do. They were frustrated in the job. They had a high turnover because they felt they were being set, to, set up to fail. And management was frustrated because they thought they spent lots of money on training. They were getting no bang for the buck. 
when the reality is they do just really adjust their training plan to ensure that they met their needs of their uh, their technology and the project they're moving forward. And it was fixed, but it cost them a lot of money to fix it. What's your take on that? Well, I think metrics, when it comes to training, are a necessary, a necessary evil uh, because you just don't know the return on your investment with, you know, expenditure of training. And you know, if you've got training that's um, that falls down on being able to produce a return on investment at an achievable, you know, um, goal setting point, you know, it, it really, you know, the business falters because you're not getting the t- you're not getting that ROI on the people that are going through the training when you expected that. So your whole timeline for projects is null and void almost because you're you're not seeing that that feedback and you're so so right with what you said the training programs need to have almost an inbuilt mechanism to offer or or, or collect data from surveys of the users to identify where it falls down um, because it's going to in, impact obviously not only the da- the, the data uh, training provider or essentially the in-house training that has been bought by the organization to help um, train up for their cloud infrastructure isn't that right you know it's just a, it just makes so much sense having the metrics um, it's just how can it not be there <laughs> yeah and the metrics some people call it a report card on people who went through training and that's not the case at all i mean what we're doing is trying to figure out their effectiveness with the training we're able to provide them through questionnaires that come back from them so in essence it's great it's them grading us uh the people who are architecting the system and i think that the ultimately management and the team leads and people who are actually migrating into cloud need to consider what you know these folks really are they're your they're your clients they're the people who make you successful and if you're not able to provide them with the information and you're getting feedback as such then you're failing them and it's really you know the ability to kind of understand this and make the adjustments um, versus a lot of um, organizations have a tendency to push back and I don't think that's a good healthy way to do it. And you, if you're uh, in charge of building clouds and people are training you, and if you feel you're not getting the training you need, then speak up because uh, if they don't want to listen, that's someplace you shouldn't be. Uh, And number one, it allows you to get the training you need to be successful and then everybody's happy. And I, I don't think too many organizations will push back on you requesting that different training occur because you're missing some aspects of building the systems. But it's good that we have this bi-directional communication. We have this metrics in place. We have some good planning in place. And we're considering the needs of the, of the people who are consuming the information. This is not a one-size-fits-all deal. You have to adjust your training based on the skills metrics, what you need to do. You have to address your training based on the capabilities and the way that people want to learn. And then more importantly, top it off, we have to have some metrics, including some feedback from the people who are getting the training and adjust the training to make sure they're going to be more effective. Any final thoughts? I was about to say 100 percent and very well said. I, I don't think um, I don't think I can really add, add to that. It's uh, it's uh, everything that, that training should be, really. And certainly from my point of view, when it comes to recruiting and making sure the right teams are put into the right place, you want to know about you know, ongoing training within organizations. One of the key things that people actually look for when they're looking for work is what what is the on the in-house training looking like? What am I going to, to learn from that as well? So there's always those questions when, you know, I'm talking to people about roles, etc. You know, there's always that thing, well, you know, this this role looks great. Are there any opportunities to learn? What are the opportunities to learn in-house? So it's fantastic. We to have that dialogue at the beginning of uh, a career move or you know you know within identifying a new role or an opportunity for someone having those conversations sooner rather than later um, it's not only rapport building but you you get to know why that person wants to do the role and what the company has uh, in store for the long term so that would be my my only kind of final thought on what you've just said no it's a great way to end the show yeah i appreciate it everybody needs to go out there and understand this is an important aspect of moving into cloud and you got to have a plan. You got to figure out who you're training, and you got to figure out how to get metrics back from them. You do those three things well in 19, 2019, you'll have a very successful year. Good luck to you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for being part of the se- um, sorry the training show this week. Um, I know you've had a, a crazy schedule so far, so but I really appreciate your uh, your time, and I hope you have uh, some great great fun in Sydney. <laughs> got it. Peace, guys. 
Thanks very much, Dave. I really appreciate that. And thanks for watching, everyone. We really do hope you enjoyed watching this week's training show on training metrics and 2019. So get planning on what you'd like to achieve and how you'd like to achieve it. Thanks for watching. Remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share this video with your friends and colleagues. You can also get us on iTunes as well on our podcast weekly. And Dave's on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum. I'm on Twitter also, which is at Nelson underscore Hilliard. Thanks again for watching and stay tuned for next week's training show.